You know, today is Veterans Day, and I'm just wondering if we have any vets here. Is there any, any veterans? If you, would you stand? If you, if, you, if you served, would you stand? None? We're all pacifists here. Is there any fans? All right. I right. just want to say thank you. Thank you. You know, um, just a couple things. First of all, um, people, some folk have asked me about my limpingness. I, about 27 years ago, maybe 28 years ago now, uh, they think, they're not sure, it's not limpingness actually, a, a virus they think attacked my cerebellum and knocked my balance out of whack. And so, I mean, I was wheelchaired for a while, they, wasn't sure, they weren't sure I was going to walk again, it was just a long, long story. But um, I live my life basically on a balance beam. So if you come up behind me and you slap me on the back, hey, good to see you, you're knocking me down, right? We're gonna be on, you're going to be picking me up. Uh, now my kids are used to that. Folk who hang around me a while, they just, they're used to, oh, dad fell down again. Okay, not a bit. You okay? Yeah, all right, fine. And so if you see me fall down, just, just, it's okay. It's not a big deal. Don't be nervous about it. Um, also, you know, uh, I want to mention a, a resource I've got. Just several years ago, I had, I'd had, I'm a pastor. I had multiple people over the years ask me, hey, you know, what would you recommend about A or B, you know, whatever. And so I started a newsletter, monthly newsletter, um, because there are so many resources out there, great resources, I mean, fantastic resources, but we don't know about them because they're usually um, in, drowning in a sea of twaddle and quasi-heresy and just all kinds of stuff that's out there that is, they're not used to your money and will really, sometimes we can be overwhelmed. And so what this thing does is it's really a monthly newsletter where I just highlight a resource. I don't get kicked back from any publisher or anything. Um, it's a, it's a, um, a newsletter we call Bright so that we can be brighter light. And so if you can pop the QR code, is it up there? Yeah, so if you're interested in signing up for this, um, again, we'll never ask you for a donation. It's nothing like that. You can unsubscribe at any point. It takes you max five minutes to look at. You might say, yeah, I'm interested. No, I'm not. Um, now, this will take you to my church's newsletter page and so there's a quadrillion newsletters just dump down to the bottom and you'll see one bright you can sign up for that and sometimes it's a devotional we'll send to you uh, but often it's just a uh, resource a book a app something out there that is designed to help us grow in Christ I love to read and so I'm uh, Constantly, I'll come across something that's really good. And I'll say, everybody should, should read this. I don't know, if you've, if you've read Delighting in the Trinity, have you read this? It sounds like a boring book, doesn't it? Delighting in the Trinity. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, Michael Reeves, it's a thin book. Michael Reeves, it's just an, if you, Trinity is kind of like a nice doctrine to you. You read that and you go, oh yeah, oh the Trinity. Oh, it's the most important thing in the world. Yes, yes, yes. It is really that good. So there's just a lot of stuff out there that, um, Sometimes we can get lost, and that's what Bright hopefully, hopefully will pinpoint, straighten out. But let's, let's pray as we, as we continue on, though, as we look at our study. Because, Father, we, we pray this evening, and we ask that you quiet our spirits, you quiet our, our souls, that we would be before you like a weaned child, not not looking to ourselves as any great bastions of wisdom, recognizing how much we need you, and praying that you would teach us, that you would give us, that you would make us this evening. Amen. You know, years ago, I was a senior pastor at a church in, in Pennsylvania, and um, so Saturday afternoon, I was in the office, I was in the office a lot of Saturday afternoons, and a couple came in, and I hadn't seen them in a while, elderly couple, and I hadn't seen them in a while, so I, they went into the office with our copy machines deal, so I, I followed them in just to say, hi, how you doing? And I asked, hey, how you guys doing? And the gentleman, um, he came right up to me, and I'd say we stood nose to nose, but he was several, it was shorter than I was, so it was kind of like nose to, to throat or lower chest, and, and he, he stood there, and he just glared up at me, and he said, you want to know why we're not here anymore? And I said, I'm Sure. He said, because I don't like the senior pastor. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is a joke, right? Okay, I'm waiting for the punchline that never came. He just stood there staring and glaring at me. I mean, what do you say, right? If you're the senior pastor, what do you say? Ah, you know, sometimes I don't like them either there, Larry. Sorry about that. Or, you know, uh, the things that come through your mind 
later on, you, you know, well, you know, thank you so much for your forthrightness. Most folk, when they want to display their incredible rudeness and ungodliness, they write an anonymous letter, but here you are. Thank you for this. I don't know. I, I, whatever I said, I don't know. Went back to my office, and I was quite offended. I thought of what that gentleman said. I thought, oh, I was quite offended. You know, we, we can get easily offended in this life. Lots of stuff to offend us, Correct. I mean, in some of us, it's, it's like a hobby. This is all we do. We get offended all the time. Um, his name is Kevin DeYoung. I don't know if you know Kevin DeYoung. He wrote an article on his blog, um, Why Are We So Offended All the Time? And he says, I'm not going to read the whole article, but this is what he says. He says, for starters, being hurt is easier than being right. To prove you're offended, you just have to rustle up moral indignation and tell the world about it. To prove you're right... You actually have to make arguments and use logic and martial evidence. Why debate theology or politics or economics if you can win your audience by making the other guys look like meanies? There's nothing like being offended to nail your opponent. No one wants to look like a jerk, and no one wants to come off as a freewheeling dealer of pain. As a result, we end up held hostage by the possible taking of offense. It's rarely asked whether such offense is warranted or whether it even matters. No, if there is offense, there must be an offender. And offenders are always wrong, so we demand apologies. Sometimes, no doubt, because a genuine sin has been committed, but often we demand apologies just because we can. It's a way to shame those with whom we disagree. It forces them to admit failure, to keep looking like a weasel. The weakest offense taker can now bully multitudes of intelligent men and women through the emotional manipulation that goes with chronic offendedness. So let me ask, do you have a problem with chronic offendedness? I mean, not you, right? But the person next to you, do they have a problem? Don't answer out loud, you'll get in trouble. And uh, chronic offendedness is nothing that's easily seen in a mirror. So even asking the question, um, you might not be the best one to answer that. You know, some of y'all probably offended that I even asked that question. Uh, but, but maybe we need to ask your spouse or, or some of your best friends or your family if you have an issue with this. Because, because we would say right away, you know, I don't, I don't get offended. I get hurt. It's the same thing. I don't get offended. I get angry. It's, it's the same, same category. It's all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all the same thing. And, you know, so sometimes when we're, we're, we're offended, um, the people were like the guy in my story. Uh, they're, they're, they're mean. They're, people are just sometimes, folk, try to hurt you. And they do, right? But sometimes the people don't have an antagonistic bone in their body. They are, are just caught up in their own stuff. They've got their own deadlines. They've got their own crises. They're just, and so they're really not sensitive to our issues. They're not thinking about us. They've got their timeline. They've got to go. And so their answers are curt, and we get a bit offended. Or sometimes we get offended because of silence. You know, I expected an applause there, and no one gave me an applause. I, I was waiting for someone to say, attaboy. No one said, attaboy. Man, no one told me it was good. And we get angry because of the silence. We're, we're offended. Sometimes we, invite, sometimes we invite it on ourselves, don't we? You know, uh, you would not believe what my children said when I asked them what they thought of my casserole recipe. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe we would believe. You would not believe what my friend said when I asked her if she thought I was bossy. Yeah, yeah, maybe we'd believe. How about this one? You would not believe what my husband said when I asked him if this dress made me look fat. <laughs> you would not believe it. Well, maybe we would believe it. I mean, this guy was an idiot for saying it, right? But we would believe it all the same. We invite those kind of things upon our, ourselves uh, because we live in a world where there, it's almost like there's nothing but a bunch of opportunities for us to be offended, right? I didn't get that promotion again. You know? and, and I got cut from the team, and, or I didn't make the play, or I was told that I don't have a voice like Matt's or Lala's, that I'm not good enough to sing Sunday morning on their worship team, <laughs> Fine, Pavarotti. You know, I hope you guys get chronic laryngitis. Now, I don't care about it. And I can't, but did you hear her? The way she, 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 she demanded this of me. She's not the boss of me. He's not the boss of me for crying out. You know what? He, she, didn't, she didn't even look at me when she passed me the hall. Did you see the way she glared at me? 
And, and he, this, he didn't even, even say a, a word to me. Oh, did you hear the tone that he used when he talked to me? I was chronic offendedness. We're offended all the time, all the time. And I got to say on the front end that, that, that there are things, there are legitimate things in life. And let me, let me, let me phrase this, though. There are legitimate abuse-type things in life where the pain is... is absolutely horrific and it's incredibly deep and you still will need to forgive but you're probably going to have to have some help to get there but 99 percent of the stuff that offends us that hurts us is not in that category right that's this kind of stuff we're, we're talking about because chronic offendedness is one of those obstacles that it can destroy your marriage in a second if you don't get over that if that continues to be in your marriage that marriage may not last real long, because let's face it, who wants to live with an individual who's chronically offended? Where every time you say anything or do anything, you're on eggshells and you put it through a gauntlet of caveats and excuses and apologies, because you're just not sure if this is going to be the deal that lights their very short fuse. Who wants to live like that? And sooner or later, the person won't, or else they, they definitely won't in a healthy way, ever. They'll either leave or they'll stay there in a very healthy way. Uh, predicament and again we might say well if people would just not say hurtful things to me if people would just not uh, 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 cause me to be treated with disrespect you know or dishonor me and at the risk of offending anybody bottom line is this often our chronic offendedness is nothing more than oversensitivity due to selfishness and pride that results in a big fat ego that's really that's really Bottom line. And when my big fat ego bumps into other people's big fat ego, it gets bruised. And the bigger and fatter my ego, the more it's going to bump. And the more it bumps, the more I get bruised, and it's chronic offendedness. So here's the deal. The principle, because we've been going through you know, principles from Proverbs, right, to help us overcome these obstacles to oneness. Uh, the principle that we're going to hit tonight really has the potential to I think, radically alter every relationship in our life, not just our marriage. And I know that's a huge claim, and I understand it's a huge claim. But I'm hoping that by the time we get done with the study, you'll, you'll say, yeah, yeah, absolutely, I see that. Because our principle tonight, if embraced, uh, not only will set us free, but will set all those around us free. Uh, if, if we embrace this, it will allow us to enjoy the intimacy of God more. It will allow us to have a greater satisfaction in life. It will go a long way to healing marriages. It will help your spouse say that they are happy that they married you if we can embrace this principle. And so we're going back to, to Proverbs, and we're looking at this as a great uh, book. There's just so much richness here as Solomon is going through this, this deal with his boy, trying to help him figure out how to manage life. He gives him all of these principles. And one of the things he mentions to Rehoboam, we'll get into it in a second, but he says, Rehoboam, as king, even as king, people will offend you. Uh, they shouldn't. I know that's foolish for them to do it, but even as king, they will. And you know what you can do as king when someone offends you? You can have their head cut off. <laughs> you can do that. Yes, as king, someone offends you. And that's it. But if you do that, if you do that, it won't destroy them as much as it will destroy you. And here, here's, our, here's our text. It's Proverbs 19.11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. What a great, what a, what a great verse. Again, we just want to stare at it. We want to uh, look underneath the verse. We want to walk around it and look at it from different uh, perspectives. And so let's do some Hebrew word studies for a little bit. So that good sense, what is that? What word? That is actually, it's translated wisdom in some other places. That is the, this, the, here's the word picture behind this word. It's you're in the middle of a major storm, and, I mean, I mean, threatening, life-threatening storm, and everyone around you is losing their mind. They're just kind of freaking out. But you, the person with the good sense, they, they remain calm. They are able to look beyond the storm of what could be, what should be, what, what ought to be, and they're able to make decisions in an appropriate way. It's, 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 if you are in an emotional storm, you're able to be calm. Now, listen, when you and I get in an emotional storm, you know how we respond. We respond to a couple ways. 
Uh, we put up a defense, right? The walls come up. If you feel like you're under attack, what do you do? This is just a fault system. This isn't anything I think about. This is just what I naturally do. So what we all, propensity, would do this. If you attack me, my walls come up. You keep attacking me, my cannons come out. And I begin to fire. It's, it's walls and cannons. That's, that's how we respond. But this, if you look at the text, put this together here. It says that when this guy's in an emotional storm, before the walls start coming up, before the cannons start coming out, before they start firing... He assesses the situation. He slows down, stops. He's able to see beyond. He's able to see when the dust settles on this thing. He's able to see what, what needs to transpire. Uh, it, good sense, makes him slow to anger. Now, the slow to anger, I love this. It's made up of a couple of Hebrew words. Slow is the word for long. It's protracted, elongated, right? Anger is the word for nostrils. Is someone who is slow to anger has a long nose. Yes. You say, what, is, what, is that? what does that mean? <laughs> What's that about? Well, if you think about the dragons, remember from, from ancient folklore, when they got ticked off, what happened? Well, they breathed all kinds of fire out of their nose, and they incinerated everyone around them when they got angry. And when we get angry, it's said that our nostrils begin to flare, and the nose gets red. And so someone who's got a long nose... Simply saying it takes a long time before their nose goes off. They've got a long wick. They, they have to, to go through a lot before they get to that place of totally coming unglued. They tell you they've got a long nose. You ever been around anybody with a short wick? You ever have to live around someone with a short wick? Oh, man, 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 man. You know, it, if you are the most intelligent person in your industry or on your floor, or in your store, or in your office, but you've got a short wick, you've got a short nose, you do not have biblical wisdom, right? Because that's what it says. Biblical wisdom, good sense, gives someone a long nose. So you may be very, very smart, but you don't have biblical wisdom. Uh, let's look at the next line. It is to his glory... To overlook an offense. Let's start at the back and work our way up. Offense. What is offense? You know, sometimes when folk offend me, sometimes, most of the time probably, they don't really, they're just not really thinking. They're not really trying to be hurtful. They just thoughtless, careless, right? But sometimes they do. And it's interesting. This word offense is the word for transgression, for iniquity, for sin. So this, this offense that's taken here it's not a misunderstanding. It's not a my, me being oversensitive. This person truly sinned against me. They sinned against me. I mean, if God was to look at what they said or what they did, God would say, sin, this, this person sinned against me. And you know what I want to do when someone sins against me? Now, if it's a misinterpretation or we can, we, you know, there's different views here and there, I, I've got some gray space, oh, I've got to be careful. But when they sin against me, it's straight up sin, you know what you do? I mean, I know what I do. Justice! Someone has to be held accountable. There is sin here, and we've got to make sure that it's taken care of properly. And it's like all walls and cannons. That's what, what's going to happen here, justice. But the text says that it's to his glory to overlook an offense. Overlook. Overlook is the, uh, it means to wink at. It means to um, not take serious. It, it, here's, it means to not dwell on. So when it overlooks an offense, it's important. When, it, when we overlook an offense, it doesn't mean I just zip it and I think all these things, but I just don't say them. Okay? That, that's not what this means, that I'm not giving words to my rage in my heart. I'm just keeping everything locked up. To, to overlook an offense means I'm not even going to let it in my heart. I'm not giving this thing any traction. I'm not going to rehearse those, those tapes and play them over and over. And give, no, 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 they're not, they don't, they don't, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to assume good intent. Oh, I'm just letting it go. That's not even having a place in my mind. I'm guarding my heart is kind of what they're, they're, they're doing here. Uh, now, another word for overlook and offense, overlook, is forgiveness. And C.S. Lewis said that everyone loves forgiveness until they have to give it, right? That's, that is a, whole, that's a little bit harder to overlook an offense, but, but this is the, the characteristic that, that I want in my spouse and that you want in your spouse. 
Because who wants to live with someone who's constantly telling me that I'm a failure? I know I'm a failure. I know I struggle. I don't need it shoved in my face all the time. I need someone who's going to give me grace. Someone who's going to give me mercy. Someone who's going to allow me to be human. Someone who gives me room to be on this journey of sanctification. Someone who, who's not going to require perfection on every single little thing. But they overlook an offense. This is what I want with my spouse. But for me... Remember, if it's a real sin, it's justice, baby. <laughs> you know, I want it for you. I want it for my spouse, but I don't want it for me, man. I've got to be. We got to. We got to hold people accountable. Well, I've got to have. It's all walls and cannons, and so we, we don't like to overlook an offense personally, but we like other people to overlook ours. I guess is what it's getting at. We can look at the uh, psychology, of course, of it all. Why uh, does someone? Why do you find chronic offended people? And, you know, obviously, well, maybe they were hurt a lot in the past. You know, hurt people hurt people. And that's true. But we can't let that be an excuse, right? I mean, it can't be an excuse. Because I was hurt in the past, therefore, I have full reign to not be held accountable and say whatever I want to say and hurt whoever I need to hurt and just do what I need to do. That's not an excuse. I mean, if that's so, that 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is just not true. And we talked about this, I think, last night. That no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able God knows your baggage, he knows what you're able, and he won't let you be tempted beyond it. But sometimes we think, I am being tempted beyond it. Um, I know when I was, uh, when I had my balance, I loved to play racquetball. And I also, I like to play people who were worse than me because I always smeared them. You know, I walked away, I always beat the tar of them, that felt great, you know. But I never got any better. And so when I played people who were better than me, I usually lost but I got better. We, we, God knows maybe this whole thing is part of his discipleship program. And he knows what I can handle. He's not going to give me just... A, he, so he's going to take me right to the edge where I think I can't handle it. But when I handle it, what happens? Well, I get better. I, I grow. And this is what I think he does for us. We can't just say, you know what? This is just the way I am. Because God's goal is to change us from being just the way we are by his Holy Spirit to make us the spouses. You know, I tell folk every time I do a wedding, I say, you know, I think I've done this every single wedding I've ever performed. I say, you know, the best thing you could do for your spouse, absolute best thing, is to walk close to Christ because you don't know how to be the husband or wife that they need. I know you think you do. You don't have a clue. But God knows because God made them. And God knows, God knows there's stuff that you don't even know. And God knows exactly what they need. And as you get closer to Christ, you know what? You will become more of the husband and the wife that they need. And so he's moving on. We've got, okay, it's to his glory to overlook an offense. His glory. The word means beauty. It means uh, attractiveness, comeliness. There's something attractive, isn't there, about someone who when we, we watch someone say something mean to them, and we watch them, can, walls don't come up, cannons don't come out, and actually they, they respond well. We're wondering, did they hear what just happened? There's something attractive there. Wow, that, that person has a level of maturity. There's something comely, there's something beautiful about that. And I know you all are not going to believe this, and you just have to, you know, what you believe is, okay, that's fine. You might not believe this, but there have been a time or two where I did not handle offense well. I did not overlook it. And I got to tell you, it was not a thing of beauty. You would probably not have watched me not overlook offense. You probably would not be watching me when my walls went up and my hyper nuclear cannons came out. You would probably not be watching that saying, you know what? What a godly man. What an incredible example. I want my children to grow up and be just like you. Probably would not be saying that. I mean, this is the ironic thing with this. When, when I'm under attack, and my walls go up and my cannons come out, it's because I'm trying to protect my glory. I'm trying to protect it. But actually, while I'm trying to protect it, I lose it. It's when you know, don't protect your own glory. It's when you overlook the offense. That's when you gain it. That's when you, you gain it. Now, it's interesting. This, this, this proverb, it works like all the other proverbs, like all of Hebrew poetry. We mentioned that this morning. There's line A and line B. And line A ends in the word anger. Do you see this? 
ends in anger. This is a proverb about anger. And, and this is, is, is fascinating because there are different ways we respond when, according to how well we know the person, according to our public situation when we are offended. Uh, there are screamers. My wife's a screamer. Mrs. Han certainly was a screamer. Um, where you, where, you know, you, they, just, they just let it all go. And spit's flying and maybe stuff is flying and they're <laughs> screaming. And then there are the silent screamers. That's the category I fit into. And the stuff isn't flying, but you know what? The Instapot lead comes on and locks. And it just starts boiling inside. And the t- tires, can, I can squeal my tires like Jeff Gordon, man. I, he's got nothing on me. And I can slam the doors. And sometimes I can stay silent for days just trying to punish the other person. That's that. Turn it, it works sometimes. Yeah. The silent screamers. It's anger. It's anger. Just because it's not manifested the way I manifest it doesn't mean it's not. Look at uh, Proverbs 29.11. So he says about anger, he says, A fool, not a wise person, not someone with good sense, a fool gives full vent to his spirit. The NIV translate that, translates that word rage. But a wise man quietly holds it back. Proverbs 16.32. Whoever is slow to anger, whoever has a long nose is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. It's just in, in, here's a problem in marriages, I see it, is sometimes we become so familiar, we just feel like that's a safe place. I don't know what we exactly mean when we say that. It's a safe place for me to let all of my sin out not have to work on sanctification, not have to work on actually trying to hold things. It's, it's, it's a place where I can just blow out all of my ungodliness all over everyone in the family. But it, doesn't, it says here that he who rules his spirit is more powerful than one who takes a city. I think a, a case study on this, so how does this look in life, how does this look when we work it out, is, is the book of Jonah. And you, you know the book of Jonah. Let me just give you background on the book of Jonah, though, because Jonah was a prophet, uh, northern kingdom, Israel, in 750. You know, Israel was one big deal, and then uh, right after Solomon died, there was a civil war, so 900. So it split northern Israel and southern Israel, like, kind of like uh, uh, North Vietnam and South Vietnam, North Korea, South Korea, but the north called, called themselves Israel, the south called themselves Judah, all right? So Jonah is up in the north, 750. And the king is Jeroboam II. And never since Solomon has Israel been in such a golden era. They were a military powerhouse again. They were an economic powerhouse again. They're pushing their borders out again. The, the, the Edomites are on the run. The, the Assyrians, he's a new, new bully on the block. They are on the run, and Israel is chasing them and basically chases them back to their capital, which is Nineveh. And, and, and Jonah, the guy who, who, who prophesied all this, was, I mean, this was Jonah. He told Jeroboam II, go after him, push out the borders. And so Jeroboam II is listening to Jonah and doing all this. And so Jonah is actually a, a rock star in the north. Everyone knows him. He's the key advisor to the king. He's like a main player. Everyone loves Jonah. They're erecting statues to him. And he's thinking, along with Jeroboam II, when we take over Nineveh, what should we do to the people inside there? They're having these discussions. And God comes to Jonah. It says, Jonah, 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 uh, I know you've been thinking about Nineveh, me too. And I want you to go to Nineveh and preach. And, and Jonah does not like this assignment. And he doesn't like this assignment because these are his enemies. And he knows if he, an Israelite, walks into enemy territory, what's going to happen? How's that going to work, right? And he knows something about the Assyrians, that their own chronicles, the Syrian chronicles, let us know that these were very, very, very cruel, inhumane people. What they did to their conquered peoples were, was just absolutely horrific. And part of it was to try to teach all other peoples that, need to be, that they need to be in subjection to them and not push back, because if you do, this is what we'll do to them. But they also did these things to their own people. They were just not a nice group of folk. And, and Jonah's thinking, God, these people don't need a sermon. These people definitely don't need a second chance. These folk need lightning bolts. That's what they need. And so that's what you need to do. And so God says, no, I want you to preach. I want you to go east, go there. And so Jonah goes to Joppa, Tel Aviv, and he goes west. 
He's going to Tarshish. He's going to Spain, which in his mind is the end of the world. He's, going, he's getting as far away from this, these people as he can possibly be. And you know, you know this little Jonah story, storm breaks out, and the sailors, now these are sailors. They had seen all kinds of storms. They lived in storms on the high seas. This was their deal. But there's something different about this storm. This was a paranormal thing going on here. And so they line up all the people and say, okay, who's to blame here? And Jonah's like, mm, I'm sorry, my bad. Yeah, I should have told you all about this. And so they take him and they throw him into the Mediterranean Sea. And a fish swallows him up. And he is in the chapter 2, he is in the belly of the fish. There's only 10 verses in chapter 2, but it's a prayer. And he's rethinking his actions. The belly of this fish, he's thinking, you know what? Maybe I've been a little bit harsh on God. You know, maybe going to Nineveh wouldn't have been such a big deal after all. He's being digested with seaweed and other fish in his belly. He's going, you know what? This probably, it's got to beat this. And so he says, okay, Lord, I'll go. And so the fish goes back, spits him back up, and he has to walk all the way to Nineveh. He gets to Nineveh. And he walks through the uh, streets of Nineveh, and he preaches, and his message is not a very seeker-sensitive message. It's 40 days, y'all, and you guys are toast. God's going to blow you all up in 40 days. (laughs) Stinks to be you. This is his message. That's it. Not a seeker-sensitive message, but still, somehow, somehow, even with that message, the whole place converts. I mean, from the king to the lowest slave, all of them repent. I mean, all the folk 120,000 people. Now, now, if I ever preached a message and 120,000 people repented, I'd be thinking it's a pretty good day. But, but, but Jonah, not so much. Now, Jonah, not so much. Um, let me read. I don't think I've got this one on the screen, but this is the um, last verse of chapter 3. It says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, they all repented, God relented. Because that's a theme in the prophets. If we repent, God will relent. And so God relented. Yep, they repented. He he relented. That's the way it works. He relented of the disaster that he had said that he would do to them, and he did not do it. Well, what does Jonah think? Here we go, chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, now you can't... Get to, you got to get this prayer right. He's not saying, oh, Lord. It's not always, he, remember, he's, he's displeased exceedingly. He's very angry. It's, oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? I knew you were going to do this. Now, this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew you. I knew this is just what you do. You're gracious, God, and merciful, and you're slow to anger, and you're abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. I knew you were going to, I knew you were going to do this. He's ticked off. He's ticked off. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Sometimes we get, not, not y'all, sometimes I may end up in an argument and I know that my side is the losing side. And what, what I'm trying to promote here is just a stupid thing. But you know what? I do not want to lose. And I'd rather die than lose. And so you keep going, right? Well, chapter next verse, uh, the Lord said to, to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? <laughs> is this a good thing? But this is wild. Verse 5, look, what, look, look, what Jonah, look how Jonah answers. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself. Jonah doesn't even answer God. Now, one of two things. Either A, Jonah didn't hear him because you know what? Our anger, our not overlooking the offense, it, it, I think it deafens us to God's voice. It's hard to hear the voice of God when you're in disobedience. So either that, either he just, just didn't hear him, or B, he's just ignoring God. You know, God and I are not on speaking terms. I'm not talking to you, God. He's just, he just, he's refusing. Maybe if you remember saying one like this, I am refuse to enjoy life, to do life, unless it goes the way I want it to go. I refuse to have decent faith in God unless he does things the way I want things done. I refuse. This is Jonah. This is where he's going. Verse 6, now the Lord God appointed a plant. Now Jonah goes out. He just sits outside the, the city, right, to uh, sits out his booth, wait. He's going he's to wait to see if God's going to blow up the city after all. He's hoping he will. He says, now the Lord God appointed a plant 
and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad. Now Jonah's kind of exceeding lots of stuff, right? He's all over, he's up, and he was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up, it, the next day God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And uh, the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. By the way, this is not a story about Jonah and the whale. This is Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the weed, Jonah and the worm, Jonah and the wind. Because each of those four things throughout this text, God appointed. This is God and Jonah. And all of nature, from the smallest thing, the worm, to the biggest thing, the whale, they all obey, weeds, they all obey God. But Jonah, representative of God's people, not so much. Not going to obey God. Someone who's actually in covenant relationship with God. No, I'm not interested. So it's a whole different deal. I love the John, right? But so, so, so right now, there's these, he's faint. And so he asked that he might die. Here we go again with that. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. You know, you see there's a progression going on with Jonah. This happens with, with folk who harbor anger. And a lack of forgiveness, and an in, in, in ability, a refusal to overlook an offense. First, he's angry over this massive event. Now he's getting angry, I mean, I mean, ballistic angry, over a stupid weed, right? I mean, a dollar twenty-nine cent weed you could buy at Walmart. He's he's freaking out over over this thing. He's just an angry person. He's an angry, miserable person. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? You know, it's interesting. Jonah was an interesting character because he was, he was a prophet. I mean, this guy knew the word of God. I mean, this guy had been appointed by God. Jonah, he was a, the pastor. He was the main guy. But Jonah was at a place, because of his inability, his refusal to overlook an offense, to forgive. He, he was, I mean, this is, what, this is what this does to us. He was so myopic. People, they can all be damned. I'm just concerned about my comfort. I don't, I don't have any tears for God's tears. I'm not concerned with really what God's concerned about. I'm just concerned about my comfort. And, and this, that weed gave me comfort of some sort. And I'm, I'm worried about this weed, and I have no, no uh, capacity for emotion or attention on God's values, on who God is, on God's people. And that's what happens to us. And you know, in time, of course, that's what happens to us as we hold, as we quit refusing to overlook an offense. That's what happens to us with our spouse as well. We just become, we pick, we're knitters, pickers of greater knit over and over. It gets deeper and gets, it gets, it gets deeper. Um, now, one of the things also this does for us, I think, is it blinds us for, from what God has had to overlook for us or forgive of us. There was a day when uh, Peter, remember, you know the story, when Peter asked Jesus, I think it's Matthew 18, um, Lord, um, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Should I forgive seven times? He's probably thinking he's pretty good because the rabbi said you only had to forgive three times. So Peter's like, I beat them out. And Jesus uh, says, no, 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 Peter, 70 times seven, right? And he's not saying, you know, at the 491st time, you can start, you know, losing it on folk. And you don't have to forgive him anymore. What he's saying is, Peter, Peter, this is like asking me, how often should I love? You're, you're a loving person or you're not. You're, you just love or you don't love. Same thing with forgiveness. You, you're a forgiving person or you're not. You forgive or you don't forgive. That's, that's just the way, it, that's the, way, that's the way it is. And then Jesus gives a parable. You know, the parable of the uh, guy who owed his master, you know, tons and tons. And he, he, he had uh, defrauded his master of all kinds of money. 
And it goes before the master, and the master forgives some of it all. Man. But then he finds a guy who, who owes him 50 bucks, and he chokes him, and he throws him in prison. And the master hears about this and pulls this guy aside and says, whoa, whoa, look at all I forgave you. You can't forgive. And you understand, right? This is us. And this is, we're, it's us and God. He's forgiven us so much. And the other people, the worst they do to us is that 50 bucks thing. And we're not holding them or we're holding them responsible for that 50 bucks. Obviously, parable saying you don't understand what you've been forgiven. So let me, if you thought about this, let me ask you, how many sins have you been forgiven by God? Don't answer out loud. This is semi-rhetorical. But in your mind, how many, what sin, do you think? How many sins? What sins? Of course, there's the, Murder and adultery and all those type of sins. And, uh, of course, all sexual perversion and deviancy is sin. And greed is sin. And materialism is sin. And covetousness is sin. And dishonoring parents and using God's name in vain. And and repeating gossip and lying is sin. And and, uh, James takes another step. He says, if you know to do the good thing and you don't do that, those are sins too. Not just bad things I do, but when I don't do good things, I know I should do. I know I should read my Bible and I don't do it. Well, that's sin. And I know I should pray, and I don't do it. You know, sin. And I know I should serve, and I know I should give, and I know I shouldn't click there, but I click on it anyway. Sin. And I know I shouldn't say that, but I say it anyway. Sin. And I know I shouldn't eat that, but I eat it anyway. Sin. Sin, 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 sin. So how many sins? Well, if you found a person who is really, 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 really good, they only sin three times a day, right? Only three times a day. I don't know. I've never met such a person, but okay, let's say you found such a person. Still, that would be three times a day. That's about, what, 20 times a week? It's about 80 times a month. It's about 1,000 times a year. They live 70 years at 70,000 sins. Now, if you go before the judge with 70,000 traffic tickets, what do you think he's going to do to you? 70,000, that's a lot. And at 70,000 sins, we might say, well, (laughs) all of my sins are just misdemeanor type sins, so I don't have to worry about it. Well, don't be so sure. At one point, Jesus said that um, you've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery. But I tell you, and we'd say, yeah, that's a felony sin. But Jesus said, but I tell you, if you lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. He says, Jesus said that just lusting, you know what, that's, that's a felony sin too. I'm going, oh, I don't know if I like that. And then we say, well, well, Jesus said, you know, you shouldn't commit murder. And we go, well, yeah, I've never, I haven't done that one. And Jesus said, well, hang on, maybe you have, because I say unto you that if you hate somebody in your heart, you ever hate anybody? Jesus, same, same section, he says, if you call someone a name, you ever call anyone a name? And Jesus is saying, not socially, not social ramifications, but in his book, to a degree, that's the same thing as murder. I have this feeling that we've got a lot more felony sins than we think we do. And you stand before the judge with 70,000 serial murder type of things. What do you think happens? Well, according to what state you're in, right? But it's, bam, death penalty. We're guilty. No question about that. We're guilty. But the judge leaves his judge box he takes off his robe comes and stands next to you and says you know what i can't dismiss your case i wish i could but i can't because you really did do these things and it's really not good but i can take your place for you and he dies in your stead so there is a righteousness done there with god is our judge and what he's mentioning here is when you understand how much he has done for you Overlooking the offense of others. It's not that, that difficult. You've you got to train yourself. There's going to have to be growing. There's going to have to be maturing in your heart and mind, certainly. And there's that sanctification issue. But understanding how much he's done for you will make that, that change and make that shift. And so here's the, the, the challenge. We're going to talk more about this, probably this one in, in the morning. We're getting out of Proverbs in the morning. But um, here's a challenge. Just ask yourself, just just your own self-evaluation for a second. In your own heart, are you harboring some sort of offense from someone, maybe your spouse, maybe you've told them about it many times, but it keeps coming up because it's still in your heart, or maybe you've never said anything, maybe you're one of those silent screamers, but you're still harboring the offense. And you've got two options with that, right? Uh, Unrighteousness. It's not the option. Walls and cannons is not an option biblically. You, you can put it on the table in a godly way. War can be practicing Proverbs 19.11 and overlook the offense. That means you really let it go. You forgive and let it go and give, give them room. Maybe right now, that's where you need to be. 
uh, second challenge I would make. You know, we're going to be in, in heaven sooner than we think we are. Life over on this earth will be over sooner than we think we are. Between now and the time we, we go, you know, let me encourage you to every night, every night, just drop to your knees beside your bed and just reevaluate your day. It doesn't have, not, not, not have to take two hours. I know we're tired and I, I got it. But just look through your, your week, your day. What happened this day? God, is there something I need to thank you for today? What would you do? But just be quiet before him. You don't have to talk, do a lot of talking. Just be quiet before him. Okay, and thank him for what he's done. And then maybe, second thing, is, Lord, is there something I've done today? I just need to ask forgiveness. I just want to be as clean as I can be before I go to sleep tonight. And you ask forgiveness. And then the third thing, and this is the offense thing. Lord, have I taken offense today? Has someone said something to me, did something to me that just rubbing me the wrong way? They cut me off and tried. They said that one thing. They, they, whatever. I need to let that go. I need to overlook. No, we're not going to take long, but if we were to do that every night, sincerely and genuinely, between now and the time uh, he calls us home, I mean, I wonder how different our marriages would be. I wonder how different our families would be because it's to our glory to overlook the offense, right? So we, it's, we get better. We, we are more godly. We shine more. And, you know, here's the crazy thing. Not just us, but all of those around us. Isn't it better to be around folk who are overlooking offense, who are radiating the glory of Christ, who are filled with grace and peace than, than cantankerous folk? Absolutely. We got like almost a moral obligation to rejoice in the Lord. It's not just a command that we can obey or not obey. It's like a moral obligation to overlook an offense. And so that, that would be my, my take as far as how to apply it even in our marriages. And so I want to give you just a moment. Uh, if you'd bow your heads with me, close your eyes, let's pray. But just between you and God, I want to give you an opportunity. If there's anything that God has laid in your heart, any offense you need to make, and maybe you need to go talk to uh, someone, your spouse even, sometime this evening, you can make that commitment, decide that now. And Lord, I mentioned even uh, yesterday that if you would show us anything, we will we'll be faithful to act on that which you show us. And God, if there's ways where we have been offending, would you give us wisdom there? Would you give us humility and grace there? And God, where others offend us, we don't want to be chronic offenders, chronically offended, I guess. We want to be people who reflect you and your mercy, living in light of what you have forgiven us of. And so I pray, God, for my brothers and sisters here, for myself, that you would help us to apply your word. You would remind us by your spirit to apply your word uh, for your kingdom's sake and for our marriage's sake in Jesus' name. Amen.